it's really about the technology, it's about the use, and it's about scaling it. And, and let's start with the technology, right? So from the first flight in 2008 with, with Virgin in that case, to um, proposing different pathways, uh, like the HEFA pathway under, under ASDM, where we, where we have a seat on the board, um, to doing the first ever flight uh, of a, a commercial airliner on 100% with FedEx in 2018, uh, to flying some of our military products on SAF in the mean, mean, meantime, um, the de-risking the technology is sort of you know, bread and butter and, and job number one for us. Uh, we're also the first company to announce that by 2030, all the airplanes we're going to deliver are going to be 100% SAF compatible. Welcome to Sustainability in the Air, the world's first podcast dedicated to sustainable aviation. I'm your host, Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simply Flying. Every Thursday, I have important conversations with top aviation executives technology entrepreneurs, and policymakers helping aviation take climate action. Conversations that help separate the signal from the noise. Whether you are a frequent flyer or an airline executive, if you care about sustainability or simply love traveling, welcome aboard. My guest today is Brian Moran. Brian is the Chief Sustainability Officer at Boeing. Brian has been with Boeing for over 24 years, he has cut his teeth, leading everything from brand to being the lead for government affairs in Europe. He knows what it takes to build policy, to showcase products globally that can move the needle. Brian and I discuss Boeing's SAF Plus approach, which is led by SAF, but still rooted in thinking of technologies beyond sustainable aviation fuel as well. Brian also does not shy away from the difficult conversations around Boeing rebuilding confidence and regaining trust of travelers, which we believe can be done through sustainability. Brian, great to be finally speaking in person, in London, on the boat. The last time we met, you were not yet the Chief Sustainability Officer at Boeing. Congratulations, firstly, on the role. Very well deserved and well earned. What is new and what has changed at Boeing since we last spoke? Is SAF and still the focus? Well, thank, thank you, Shashank. It's a privilege and an honor to be on the boat uh, and, and to join your, your great podcast. Um, look, it, it's, it's been humbling to take over for Chris Raymond, our first ever Chief Sustainability Officer. I got to work with Chris from the inception of this organization and uh, got to build a team around the globe that's focused on policies and partnerships and sustainability. And so uh, when I got the call uh, last, last fall uh, to take over from him, I was just honored. It, it, and, uh, and to answer your question, uh, yes, SAF and remains our strategy. And that's not some pithy slogan. Uh, that is rooted in data. As you are familiar, we have the Cascade uh, Climate Impact Model that really informs how the different levers in aerospace might unfold between now and the middle of the century. But whether you look at Cascade or the various studies from Waypoint 2050 at ATAC to Destination 2050 here in Europe, um, it tells you that SAF will contribute between 50 and 65, 70, 70% of the total solution towards decarbonization. So and that's why Boeing, from the very first flight on SAF in 2008 uh, onward, has been so focused on it. But the and is important, right? We're a technology company, and that's what excites us. And so it's SAF and because electricity and hydrogen will earn their way safely into the ecosystem of tomorrow. In the case of hydrogen, that may well be in the second half of the century. But on electrification, there are certain routes and certain missions that may electrify over time or where we see hybrid uh, propulsion play a, a small role. So it's our job to be part of that um, of that discovery. So... This is very interesting, and we're going to unpack all of that one by one. You mentioned the Cascade model. Why don't we start with that? Sure. I got a first glimpse of it in Seattle last year yep. uh, when Chris Raymond unveiled it, actually, at the Sustainable Together Forum, yep. if I recall. How has the tool evolved? What does it do? Who's using it? Yeah. So a couple of years ago, um, we grew increasingly frustrated by the fact that the conversation wasn't complete. And 
we know what the pillars are for decarbonization, roughly. I think most uh, folks by now agree to it. And just to re- recall for your listeners, it really starts with fleet renewal. As an airplane company, it's about delivering more efficient airplanes that are 20 to 30% or so more efficient than the ones they replace. That's where we really make our difference. But then it's about operational efficiency as a second lever. Flying more efficiently, using the digital brains in the airplane to fly more direct routes, to avoid weather patterns, to stop circling around airports and have continuous descent arrivals, those technologies. Third, it's about renewable energy. And we already talked about it. How does SAF in particular, but also electricity and hydrogen, earn their way safely onto the airplanes? Fourth, it's about advanced technology. Right? That, that's what gets us exciting. New aerodynamic improvements, uh, new propulsion systems, et cetera. And I'm sure we're going to unpack Cross that here. Cross-based wing. Exactly. And then lastly, and very importantly, it's also about um, market-based measures. It's about offsets and carbon removals that will play a role. And we am glad, glad to talk about that. So we have those five strategies. But when you map the air, airspace and total emissions, each of those play a different role and, and have a different contribution. But importantly, the life cycle of those energy carriers plays an in, enormously important role. Not all hydrogen is green. In fact, 80% of hydrogen today is not green. Not all electricity grids are, are, are equal. Not all SAF pathways deliver the, the, the same uh, carbon improvement um, from, from one to the other. And so those details actually matter. And, and then there is a timing component to this. When will these technologies be available? So we partnered up with MIT, with Cambridge, the Whittle Lab, with IATA and with NASA, and had those four knowledge partners sort of look over our shoulders and help us think through, okay, how would you model this out? It's an open source model. There isn't a single proprietary data point in there. All the assumptions are are transparent. And we really invite, and it's public, it's at cascade.boeing.com. So we really really invite um, the entire ecosystem to go play with it. Um, Give you a little anecdote. Uh, Last week I was here in London, uh, we had a fantastic session w- at the Royal Aeronautical Society. And uh, I gave a quick overview uh, together with the president uh, of the Aerosoc. And then we unleashed the audience comprised of industry, of academia, of government, uh, customers, including uh, the military, on Cascade. And where when you select forecast mode, let them play with their own assumptions. And then we compared notes afterwards to say, well, what did you learn? Or what, what, what's missing? Because we're co- continuously evolving Cascade, even as we speak. And so this was such a great two-way conversation, dynamic conversation. But we all walked away, I think, very excited about the potential and, and frankly, optimistic about where we're going. But also it informed just what else do we need to go study uh, as, we, as we make the tool, but more importantly, the, the entire ecosystem um, more efficient. All right. This is very fascinating. And I've been following, of course, all of your progress and updates You've held these Cascade workshops from India to yeah. Australia. Yeah. When people come out of this, what are you hoping they do? Will a Qantas suddenly hire a chief sustainability officer and establish a SAF plant in Australia, which is what is happening? <laughs> right. Or an Air India thinks, oh, we've just ordered, what, 400 airplanes. Let's uh, re- really think about producing SAF in the country. What is the goal? What do you see them going back to their desk and changing about the way they've been thinking about running the airline. Yeah, look, I, with all humility, we feel it's a source of truth and it's a it's a baseline that informs decision making. Right? I had a boss of mine once say that uh, doing everything is doing nothing, and so strategy is all about choices. And and having um, a tool by your side that lets you think through what's the relative impact of choice A versus choice B. What's my fleet uh, look like in the future? And, and uh, what contribution can SAF make vis-a-vis hydrogen, for instance, in a place where there isn't sufficient green hydrogen? What is my assumption around SAF availability and its life cycle improvement? And then start mapping out over time the path to net zero, because that's what it's all about. But not all paths are equal. And, and depending on the region, you may not have at your disposal some of the choices that other regions do. And so this allows you to really have, a, have an informed conversation. And frankly, the stakeholder set that we find most intrigued by this are regulators. Mm-hmm. Right? They have a hard job. We, we often uh, and, and, you know, talk about what, all the policies that haven't been developed yet, but I have nothing but admiration for, um, for that role because they have to balance many different and competing priorities. 
within a sector, and we're talking about aerospace, but also across sectors, right? Who's going to get the first uh, drop or the last drop of hydrogen? Is it the cement industry mm-hmm. or or the steel industry has very similar conversations around decarbonization than we do? And so being able to have an informed conversation around the different levers, the five I talked about, when they might be available and their relative contribution to decarbonization is so important for a regulator to have at their fingertips. Regulators are a good one. Um, Let me put this out to you because Boeing is such a global company. The mandate-based approach in the EU, and you did grow up in Belgium, you're very familiar with the European uh, way of doing things. That's led to a very high adoption rate today of SAF from airlines, Air France being the highest buyer of SAF last year amongst commercial airlines, DHL being the other. Uh, Whereas in the US, it's an incentive-based approach and we see the likes of United ordering more SAF in offtakes than any other airline in the world Mm -hmm. today. And we see different approaches leading to different results. What do you think, from a Boeing perspective, works better? I don't think we have a preference. Uh, what What's clear is in places where mandates are chosen and refuel EU in Europe with the 6% uh, target by 2030, um, it's important that we also consider incentives. And you were at the Sustainable Aerospace Together Forum where I had the privilege of interviewing both the lead regulator from the EU who set the policy, but also from the US who looked at the Blenders tax credit in the, uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act. And when you look at where SAF is produced today, um, incentives tend to win out, right? It started in California with a low carbon fuel standard and the Blenders tax credit, which then has been graduated, if you will, into the Inflation Reduction Act. And that's an incentive of $1.25 to $1.75 per gallon, depending on the carbon intensity of the fuel. And so you've seen a lot of producers, including European producers, uh, set up shop in the United States. Neste is providing uh, pumping stuff out of um, one, in, in California, for yeah, example. One example. So, so for for the time being, uh, incentives um, seem to be uh, pay, paying dividends. Mm-hmm. That said, we're sitting here in the United Kingdom, and we just saw a mandate uh, being published and agreed upon here uh, of of ten percent by twenty thirty. But at the same time, the United Kingdom is also reflecting on a revenue certainty mechanism, a consultation that's hitting the streets to think through what type of financial stability mechanism or or a price collar, if you will, could be put in place to de-risk the producers and the, and the, and the buyers. And so the combination of mandates and incentives may be the winning formula. The EU will be first to say, hey, we have free allowances in the emissions trading scheme. That is a form of an incentive. Now, whether not paying a tax is an incentive is, is you could, you could d- d- dispute, but um, I, I, for one, am grateful that, again, rev- uh, regulators who have a really hard choice to make across sectors, across uh, uh, time horizons, that they're so focused and they're recognizing that SAF is, is uh, a big part of the solution. I'll give you one more, Shashank. I was in Singapore recently and I had a chance to sit down with the transport minister. And here you have a very, very pragmatic um, approach that combines the two once again, m- taking a, uh, setting a mandate of 1% SAF, but and collecting revenues, I think it was between three and $16 yep. per, per ticket, depending Based on the class on the of service. Length, yeah. Exactly. Um, putting that in a pool and then going out in the next couple of years to buy down the green premium on the SAF that would have to be uplifted uh, in Chengi at the airport. Starting at, at 1% in 2026, uh, reserving the right to increase that to 3 to 5% later in the decade, but being very open and flexible just to see, okay, how will this 1% actually work out? How, how much of the green premium can we burn down? And keep it sort of in loop because what I what I and what I told the minister what I like about that system is it stays in house right you're collecting revenue from passengers but you're putting it right back into buying down the green premium on SAF versus collecting taxes that may never see any benefit uh, in in aerospace yeah and so and that, that that has been the case if you look at the APD in the UK one of the world's highest passenger duty or passenger taxes, but all of that goes in the bottomless pit called the HMRC. Yeah. Nothing is, you know, none of that is earmarked towards sustainable aviation, let alone aviation. So do you believe that the Singapore approach 
is a practical approach that other countries should follow when it comes to bringing down green premium of SAF? Look, the jury is out. We, we haven't seen it play out yet. And, and they will be the first to admit that some of the details around, okay, what blend, what carbon intensity, which f- fuel are we going to buy? That's still to be determined. But again, I find it pragmatic because I, f- I found the number still relatively small and, and hopefully manageable. And it's a bit of a pilot, I would consider it. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll see in the coming years. But uh, I, again, I, I like the combination of, of, of raising revenue, but then keeping it in loop. And look, what, what Singapore, but, but many other um, forward-leaning regulators are realizing is what we're taxing and what, we're, what we're, we're talking about here is preserving the social license to fly and preserving the economic impact and the economic benefits that come with aviation. Right, uh, benefits beyond borders. Uh, the, one of the ATAC reports, pre-pandemic, noted 4.1 percent of global GDP is directly dependent on aviation. It's 87 million jobs. It's the it's the seven trillion in goods delivered. That's what we're protecting here. And so I think when we're talking about decarbonization and how you get there, keeping always in mind the other side of the ledger. What are you actually trying to preserve here? It's so interesting. You mentioned this model as a pilot. I spoke to Sir Tim Clark at Emirates about this, and he was quite upset that raising cost of travel to travelers is something that is not economically sustainable. And my point to him was exactly what we, you and I were talking, that the cost here is small enough that I would not think about flying out of Kuala Lumpur just because I have to pay another $6 on my flight. Yes, if I'm traveling with my kids and my parents and a bunch of others, maybe I'll think about it. But it's not its not a deterrent at that point. And I don't believe there are other alternate models that we are seeing, definitely not from governments, um, but the green premium still exists. We have seen some very interesting work when it comes to green premiums coming down in the US, for example, Scope 3 Buyers Alliance. Mm-hmm. One, when do you do you believe SAF price will come to come at come to parity with jet fuel prices? And if not, what are some of the interesting ways you are seeing this green premium coming down? Yeah, look, I I think it's a hard question. There's a lot to unpack, and it's a lot about um, cost versus price. So let's start with cost. Right. So SAF is more expensive to produce, and in part that's the feedstock, the feedstock aggregation, the feedstock availability. Um, the inputs, uh, renewable electricity, green hydrogen, um, the capital required. Uh, so, so the stack starts building up very quickly on, on the cost inputs. And then price, price is about supply and demand. And, and that's the piece that over time as supply increases, that part of the equation could come down. But the cost um, is, is probably fixed. And that, that's what we need to go, go tackle. You were at the Sustainable Aerospace Together Forum, and one of my favorite panels was the last one. And it's public. You, uh, your, your listeners can, can go watch it um, uh, on, on, on the FT. We had uh, United Airlines. We had Sky Energy as a SAF producer. We had Citi, a Citi group as a, as a bank. And we had the White House uh, as a regulator. And we went around the horn, and we started, of course, with Lauren Riley at, uh, at, at United, uh, asking her about, um, hey, uh, what's your SAF purchase look like? And as you said, very, very progressive, forward-leaning airline, buying pretty much all the SAF you can. And she said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll buy even more, but, but, and I'll pay a premium, but the premium can't be infinite, right? I can't pass this cost on to my customers forever. And again, it gets back to the social license to travel, because who do you price out when you pass this down? Not, not the fo- folks in the, in the front of the cabin, not, not the folks who are on their second vacation. It's, it's the folks who, who probably take their first trip ever. Yeah. And remember, 80% of the world has never been on an airplane. And, and it's our job to make, make sure that they get to do that sustainably. Anyway, so we'll buy more, right? The airline says, well, I'll buy more if there, if there was more produced. Turn over to the energy company. So why are you not producing more? You got a customer here who's, who's willing to produce more. Well, uh, we're building a, a plant in the Pacific Northwest, and Boeing is very proud to have partnered with Sky Energy and uh, helping with the regulatory environment and, and some of the some of the strategy there. But uh, the planning horizon is such, and the capital intensity is is one where you need financing for the long term, and you need a lot of capital. These plants are not cheap, 
So you turn over to the bank. It's like, well, you got a customer and a, and a provider. Why, why are you not financing this? It's, it's, it's slam dunk. And uh, Citi said, look, we're, we're very active in this space, but we also need a, a return on investment. And we have a planning horizon that exceeds five years. It's 10 years would be way better. So we all looked at the regulator <laughs> with the Inflation Reduction Act and said, well, why is the BTC five years and not 10? And, and by, by their own admission, hey, they wanted to go further, couldn't quite get it passed, but we're working on it. And so what gave me a lot of hope is that as we were sitting there and, 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 and the four parties came together, um, we're not that far apart. And, and I think we're getting closer around you know, regions of the world where the perfect recipe, where financing will flow, where um, you know, uh, green capital will come to, the, to this very attractive business, by the way. Uh, airlines will keep buying and producers will keep producing. I think we're much closer than we actually think. And so, um, you know, policy has such a vital role to play and it's, we always get back to it. And that's why we already talked about the examples. Singapore is piloting a new, a new model. The EU is leading from the front on mandates here in the UK, a, a combination on, of mandates and incentives, us leading with incentives. And that's right now where, where the investment's flowing. So, uh, Jury's out a little bit, but it's I'm excited. It's an exciting space. It really it's, is. It's a very exciting space. And since we first met La, just over a year ago, I think things have moved a lot and very, very yeah. fast. Talking so much about SAF, and I know you want to fly a lot of planes with SAF. I think it was 42,000 airplanes in the air in 2050, according to a Boeing estimate. Yet, the supply of SAF remains very tight. Today, it's 1% or less than 1% of total global jet fuel use. How do you see that changing and what's Boeing doing to change that? Are you, you know, as chief sustainability officer, are you going to do what Delta did a few years ago and buy a refinery? No. <laughs> <laughs> Give you a short answer there. Uh, no, we're not. But we, we have a huge role to play and, and I'm proud of how we're playing it. Um, to break it down, it, it's really about the technology. It's about the use and it's about scaling it. And, and let's start with the technology, right? So from the first flight in 2008 with, with Virgin in that case, to um, proposing different pathways, uh, like the HEFA pathway under, under ASDM, where we, where we have a seat on the board, um, to doing the first ever flight uh, of a, a commercial airliner on 100% with FedEx in 2018, uh, to flying some of our military products on SAF. In the mean, mean, meantime, um, the de-risking the technology is sort of you know, bread and butter and, and job number one for us. Uh, we're also the first company to announce that by 2030, all the airplanes we're going to deliver are going to be 100% SAF compatible. And that's not a competitive space, by the way. That's where we, as an ecosystem, work together, including Airbus, including the engine companies. Uh, that's a team sport. And that team sport is really playing out in the International uh, Aerospace Environmental Group, IAEG. Uh, very proud that Boeing is now leading the work group that's studying how do we de-risk the airplanes for 100% SAF. And it, it, it sounds um, obvious, and especially when you hear things like, well, we've flown it in 2018 on a freighter. You just did a, a flight with Virgin across the Atlantic. Uh, what's there still to do? It's a, it's a drop-in fuel, isn't it? It is, but it's, uh, it's limited at 50-50, a uh, 50-50 blend uh, right now for safety reasons. And so we have to demonstrate that the airplane is capable of handling everything between zero and 100% up and down. You mentioned how few, how little SAF is available globally. What that means now by 2030 and for, for a long time to come, the airplane will actually probably never see 100% every day, all day. It'll land somewhere where there's some SAF available. It'll go somewhere else where there's a lot of SAF available. And so you really need to de-risk the airplane for the chemical composition where aromatics are present and where, where synthetic, fuel, synthetic fuel takes over. And so think about the role of fuel be, besides you know, advancing the airplane and, and being the energy carrier. It has a cooling um, um, uh, um, uh, capability. It, uh, the weight of the fuel impacts, if you think about the airplane is designed, the wings are the fuel tanks. So the wings are designed for a certain energy density. Uh, the you know, actuation systems, uh, fuel sensors, you know, everything that comes in touch with the fuel from composite materials in the wing to uh, pipelines and, and hoses to gaskets to sensors, they all have to be capable of going up and down between synthetic and, 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 and non-synthetic fuels. And so that's a lot of work. 
And it's a work on two fronts. It's a work on the fuel, figuring out the chemical composition of the fuels, and on the airplane, right, the parts that touch the fuel. So what we did is we made available a jet reference fluid list, if you will, and, and that allows our supply chain, um, who we've gathered very recently in, uh, in Seattle, to at least have a baseline against which to design and test. And so as we sit here right now, we, we at Boeing and, and some of our suppliers have um, composite pieces uh, sitting in, in synthetic fuels to see over a long duration how, how would they handle um, that particular characteristic of fuel to all kinds of other tests. And the engine companies are doing an awesome job testing. And so we're, we're all getting there. But remember, um, Shashank, the, the most important thing in this industry is safety. It has the highest safety record. And, and we'll never waver from that. And so some folks might say, well, how could it possibly take you seven years to make sure it's, a, it's 100% safe? Well, that's what it takes, both on the, on the fuel um, side, but also on the airplane side. And so, again, Boeing is very proud to play a leading role on the technology. Second area of the three where Boeing plays a role in SAF is just using it, sending a demand signal as a corporation into the value stream to say, we're going to buy it, we're going to pay a premium, and it's the right thing to do. And so just recently, we bought 35 million liters of SAF, which is both in-wing and in-fuel farm, but also book and claim, uh, as, a, as a visible sign that we're putting our money where our mouth is. That, by the way, equates to about 20% of our fuel use. So when you talk about the less than 1% available globally, you can see that we're trying to lead from the front in our own small way. We're not an airline, and I'm, but not for a second minimizing the fuel costs of these airlines. But for us, we're trying to lead the way in our own small way is to buy the fuel, uh, advance book and claim as a, as a system, uh, get it into fuel farms, demonstrating that it's real, that it can be flown. And that's how, that's how our contribution. And then the third way, that's where, and then my old job too, um, is one of the most exciting things. This is about working regionally to develop scale and, and, and production capability. So I mentioned earlier Sky Energy. We had a prepaid offtake with them and then helped them come into the United States, uh, benefit from some of the state and federal incentives. And they're well on their way in, in um, developing their own production capability in the United States. Uh, most recently in uh, Australia, we worked with the Wagner Corporation in a similar kind of way where we're trying to send, send a signal into that ecosystem helping them think through um, what, what it takes to scale SAF, because here's a country that has uh, a real need from an energy security perspective and, and just from, a, from an import perspective. Australia has done a phenomenal job uh, laying out what it will take, and Boeing has been a, a, a key player in that. We did a study with yeah, the CSIRO. The yeah, one year ago. Yeah, so it's the CSIRO study now that we did together uh, with them is, is sort of foundational in guiding how might SAF scale in that region. But that's different from, let's say, I just got back from Japan, where together with ICF, we did a study just for Japan. How do you leverage, for instance, municipal solid waste and the potential there uh, to produce SAF domestically over time? And what policies might it take? Um, many, many years ago, we did this already in Brazil with a, with a project called SAF Maps, mm -hmm. where... Um, the abundance of feedstock and the need for sustainable feedstock, we partner with the Roundtable for Sustainable Biomaterials to study, okay, how would you scale uh, SAF in Brazil and do, it so, do so sustainably? So this, if you will, business development aspect, mm -hmm. creating roadmaps and then partnering with companies to send demand signals to help them uh, unlock new potential, frankly, is one of the most exciting things we can do um, so, no, we're not buying an energy company, but in many ways, we have a role to play to help scale. Right. No, thank you so much for that detailed answer. I remember having Elena Schmidt from RSB on the podcast, and she and I debated at one point around global equity of mm. SAF. Yeah. Where do you see this going? Do you foresee each large country or, an, or each large aviation hub like Singapore having its own SAF facilities and SAF plants? Or do you foresee this going to be a much more book and claim play yeah. where, you know, uh, someone like Etihad, for example, operated a flight out of DC to Abu Dhabi and they bought all the SAF in LAX from World Energy and equivalent amount was used, uh, pumped into LAX. Do you foresee this being an energy security thing where each country wants to secure its own SAF supplies or will this be a book and claim play? 
let's start with the fact that the atmosphere does not really care where the SAF is produced or flown, as long as we keep reducing emissions. Um, There's, I don't think there is um, a pathway, especially in the near term where SAF will scale equally globally. There's going to be places where through policies, through just their natural abilities, um, SAF will scale faster than in other, other regions. Um, it is our job to make sure collectively as an ecosystem to make sure that, that as, the, as those um, differences emerge, that we preserve a level of fairness so we don't price folks out and that we enable those who want to fly on SAF and have the means to, to afford it, that they can do so in a um, verified way, in a, in, a, um, in a credible way, if you will. So RSB with their um, uh, book and claim handbook um, – the, the general principles that are necessary for for um, a, a system like that to be in place that that's super super important. We saw this play out, Shawshank, at the uh, conference for alternative avi- and aviation fuels, the CAF three, where the global South um, expressed real concerns over uh, the sort of unequal rise of of SAF um, um, d- production around the globe. And so again, I think book and claim has a has a very important role to play, and I think um, the work that IATA is currently doing as a, if you will, convener as a broker. Yeah, I think a reg- registry is what they're creating. A registry um, uh, under Mary Owen's leadership. I think that's that's uh, very promising, and uh, I look forward to to seeing that unfold here um, throughout the year. Right. I know we've delved a lot into SAF. Let's go beyond. Boeing ultimately is an aircraft manufacturer, a great engineering company. Uh, There have been lots of developments in electric. Hydrogen, we spoke a little about it. Uh, We've had both Zero Avia and Universal Hydrogen CEOs on this podcast as well. Airbus is very heavily invested in these technologies. Where does your and come from? Yeah, um, Bill Boeing in 1929 had this beautiful quote where he talked about we, we and he almost admonished us to let no improvement in flying ever pass us by, and so it was a real reminder that when there is innovation to be had in aviation, Boeing better be part of it. And if I look back from the dawn of the jet age and the 707 to shrinking the world by 40 percent with the 47, the first all composite airplane in the 87. Um, going to the moon uh, on the Apollo mission. I mean, we have plenty of, of waypoints throughout aviation and aerospace history where Boeing has proudly been part of those inflection points. So here we are um, trying to decarbonize by the middle of the century. And we already talked extensively about SAF, but the end is what really excites us. And so if you look at ele- electrification, right, the, the battery density is such that we're, and, and Cascade shows this beautifully, two, 300 nautical miles, 15, 20 people, um, that's, that's impressive, that's exciting, but it's not going to decarbonize aerospace. And so there is a role for those airplanes and for those missions, but we have to keep that be, and be very sober about the fact that that's not going to decarbonize. But as a, as, a, as a lead-in and as a pathfinder towards more hybrid propulsion technologies, that again is exciting, and it's our role to be part of that. The, um, we have a project together with NASA, General Electric, uh, called the Electric Propulsion Flight Demonstrator, EPFD, where we're taking a SOP 340 and are installing a megawatt class uh, a hybrid engine onto that airplane where Boeing is providing a lot of the airplane integration knowledge. And rewind um, 15 years, the 787 alone has more than a megawatt of onboard generated electricity. So we have a lot of knowledge on how to handle more electric airplanes. And it's that kind of knowledge that we're bringing to some of these partnerships. Just, just see how, how does elect, more electric architectures evolve over time. This is interesting. Is Boeing already testing the Saab platform? We're in the middle of I- integrating and, and working with GE and NASA on modifying the Saab 340. So mm. it's coming to a theater near you. I'd be very curious to watch the space. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is even more exciting than but the... That- yeah. Trust Wing, for example. That's I don't know. <laughs> Close. We'll talk more about the X66. But uh, So that's electrification. And, and on hydrogen, um, look, when we think about a new airplane design, it starts first with physics, unsurprisingly. But is it technically feasible? 
And so we look at, okay, how, how many Nobel Prizes are we away from, from some of the, these claims and some of these, these uh, aspirations? And, and even then, as, as we prove that technologically we can do this, and we've flown plenty of um, demonstrators, also in hydrogen, right? We've flown the Phantom I in 2012 on liquid propulsion. We, fl- we were the first to fly a two-seat uh, uh, diamond out of our research center in Madrid on a hydrogen fuel cell. And, and many examples in between. So, so even if we, if it's technically feasible, you have to ask yourself: Can you get this certified? And can you get it certified at the same or better safety level than what we enjoy today? And if the answer to that is no, you stop work. But if the answer to that is yes, then that whole second chapter opens. Just because you can do it, should you do it? And that's where we ask ourselves: What is the business case? For us, but more importantly, for our customers, with, with the infrastructure requirements, with, with turn times, if you think about the hydrogen, um, the, uh, as flammable, as leaky, as difficult to handle as hydrogen is, and we, we, we know this from our space experience, can you ensure a turn time that the Ryanairs of the world are used to at, at 25 minutes at an airport, anywhere they land? So, so you, you really start thinking about the business case of it. And then the last and maybe most important question, so can you do it? Should you do it? What's the total climate impact of that solution that you're dropping into the ecosystem? And that gets right back to Cascade. And if you right now plug in a 2,000 nautical mile hydrogen airplane into Cascade, you see the bar of goodness going the wrong direction because the assumption right now around hydrogen availability is such that as you fuel that airplane, quote unquote, the total life cycle impact because of how that hydrogen was produced is bad. And so why create a, a solution that ultimately makes things worse? Now, we're, we're optimists uh, op- optimist by, by training and, and by nature. And so as there will be an abundance of hydrogen over time and provided we get it and we can make a fair claim uh, for it vis-a-vis steel, vis-a-vis uh, cement and many other industries that are counting on it, uh, will there be a, a segment of the market that could be benefiting from hy- hybrid propulsion? Sure, that, that could well be the case. But we're taking our time and studying it both on the technological side, as I said, and then the total life cycle impact. So this is very interesting, total life cycle impact. Let's focus on that and maybe I'll push you back a little on this. Yeah, please. Let's talk about WISC. Yeah. The pilotless EV toll that Boeing has invested in and now I believe owned, it's, it's part yes. of Boeing. Why are you doing it? Because I don't think EV tolls are going to have a sizable life cycle impact on reducing aviation's carbon emissions. Or do you foresee EV tolls as a separate category? Yeah. So, so when we think about the future of aerospace, we think of it as, as being producible, digital, sustainable, and autonomous. What's producible? Uh, so, uh, um, efficient and safe production and, and your production system of the airplane. So, okay. so as, as you think yeah. about manufacturing, manufacturing the, the, being being able to produce an airplane uh, uh, in, in, in the right manner. So WISC and, and our partnership there is the perfect example of all four. If you if you look at um, the digital brains and the and the investment we're making, also with our other partnership around SkyGrid where an AI engine will help actually guide these autonomous vehicles, that's learning that we may be able to benefit uh, if you, if, as, you, as we move up the value chain. The same thing around autonomy, right? We're at WISC, uh, for your listeners, we're the only company leading with a fully autonomous eVTOL. Our, most of our competitors are putting a pilot in the loop first in the cockpit and then may or may not think about going autonomous. We feel for two reasons that... Going autonomy first is the right way forward. It starts with safety. As you're introducing tens, if not hundreds of thousands of these vehicles, your normal air traffic management system won't be able to cope with that. So having an AI engine and, and, and rules of engagement, uh, handling and that managing that traffic is one. And then the other one is, is, the, um, is the, the business case. If you have a, a vehicle of four passengers and one of the four is a pilot making X, uh, your business case for flying and competing with with a, an Uber Black, let's say, uh, is going to be um, uh, diminished. So autonomy first, but then the other reason we're doing WISC is the innovation it unleashes. Think about the again on electrification. We're building our own battery packs. We're we're thinking through thermal management. 
Uh, we're now on our sixth generation, right? We've flown over 1,600 autonomous missions on the, the, the prior five generations. So we're, this one is the one that we're going for certification with. But so anything electrification is, is, um, uh, is, is a big learning. The electric motors, um, producibility, again, it has to be efficient and safe. Um, it, can, it has to be safely produced. And so that's, that's why we're doing it. So you're foreseeing a lot of lessons from WISC being applied to the larger Boeing ecosystem as well. In these that's cases. right. That's right. And, and, and uh, as our CEO has said on a, a number of occasions, if, if that's the only reason we're doing it, that would already be pretty good. But we're, we have bigger aspirations. We actually think there is a market and there is a need for, for this vehicle. And what's also great, Shashang, and, and Brian uh, Yutko, one of my, my close yeah. friends leading it, um, the cultural dynamics – of, of the culture that's, that's, that's created at WISC, a, a Boeing company, but also the, the big Boeing will say, we're learning from WISC and WISC is learning from us. And, and when you're sort of at that, at that intersection, that's when magic happens. And so we're, we couldn't be prouder and, and more excited about the future of WISC. Right. Finally, uh, I've had two climate activists in two years of this podcast join me here. Okay. And one of the biggest pushback that they have is, air travel is growing too much. We need to just focus on degrowth, right? Boeing is in the business of making airplanes. It's simple. You produce more airplanes, you become a bigger business. Your business ultimately relies on selling more aircraft. So how can growth and net zero be reconciled? Yeah. It's what excites me the most about this job, frankly. I've been with Boeing for 24 years, um, moved with the company uh, seven times, five times across the Atlantic, and, and have gotten to see sides of this business and, and sides of your argument uh, from, from different vantage points. And it starts where, um, what I mentioned earlier, is you know, the, the four plus percent of global GDP that, that depend on aviation, the 87 million jobs, and most importantly, the 80% of humanity who've never set foot on an airplane. Um, your background, my background, growing up in, in different parts of the world, moving um, to, to other parts of the world to, to look for opportunity and to meet, meet families and friends. And um, that's not possible without aviation. And we sit here in, in, in our little podcast and, and get to um, pontificate about all those benefits. The other 80% haven't even tasted it. And so again, it's our job to make sure that they get to. And that's what also gives me hope because the strategy is pretty clear. It's not easy. It's daunting, in fact, but it's pretty clear. The five, the five levers I talked about, the, the, how we're going to renew these fleets, how we're going to introduce SAF and the importance of SAF, the new technologies we talked about, and, and market-based measures. Right. Right? Carbon removal is in an exciting field, and we recently got into, into uh, making some investments there too. I think the combination of those five strategies will get us there and we're going to preserve the economic prosperity and the, the social good that comes with aviation. To close up, I want to address trust. It's why I do this, because I truly believe that Simply Flying has been helping airlines build trust since 2008. It was digital earlier, and then during the pandemic, it was health safety, and going forward, is going to be sustainability. Boeing itself is currently facing lots of questions around trust yeah. that you're dealing with overall in the business. Do you believe your efforts in sustainability and leading Boeing's sustainability charge helps build trust in Boeing? I hope so. And, and, I, and we're not doing it because of it, but I think it is a, um, a byproduct of it. Um, one of our values at the company has been to, to re-earn stakeholder trust and hopefully preference someday. But the, the re-earning stakeholder trust after the tragic MAX accidents and some of the headwinds we face right now of, because of issues that we have caused, right? Th those at the company level, and now that I get to sit on the executive council, uh, how we re-earn trust and how we demonstrate day in, day out that the 170,000 people who every morning put on a Boeing badge trying to do their utmost and, and, and want to do the, the best job they can, that, that they're that they work in service of our, of our industry and in service of our customers, right? It, it's that, that's what's at stake. And I, I find as I travel around the world that, that this topic, look, you cannot have a um, sustainable business without a safe business. And, and that interlink between safety and, and sustainability is real. Especially in aviation. 
especially in aviation. And so I think the the opportunity that we now have to talk openly and transparently about where our shortcomings are and what we're doing to fix them, um, I, for one, find, um, I won't say energizing, but it's, it's giving me a lot of hope for the future because Boeing has been and, and hopefully will continue to be a really important player in this industry. Um, I'm very, very proud to represent it, um, especially during times like these. So I think you're, you're spot on. Uh, Reowning trust is, is probably the, the number one mission. I had uh, friends, former classmates who were in leadership roles at Uber when a few years ago, Uber was going through their own ups and downs. And I remember talking to them during that time. And yes, you know, it's really hard. But this is the most exciting time to be in the business because we get to rebuild trust. Yeah. Um, and I do wish you all the best. Uh, we mentioned the Sustainable Aviation Together Forum a couple of times. Yeah. Uh, I believe it's happening again this year. Can it you is. tell us a little about, about it? I think the audience can watch it online, isn't it? Yeah, exactly right. So um, we had our first uh, global edition in May. You came to it in Seattle. And we have had sort of mini forums um, all around the world. Uh, we had one here uh, recently, as I said, with the Royal Aeronautics Society. We did one in Brussels. We did one in, uh, in Japan. And yes, we're going to do another big one. Um, and this time we're going to Montreal um, just at the end of October, uh, October 26th to 28th. Uh, so uh, again, part of that is Boeing's role, again, with all humility, um, being a convener, being a convener of air, aerospace, finance, energy, and the regulators, right? It's those four quadrants that really have to come together. And then we're going to deep dive each of them. And look, on the technology side, uh, this is the year in many ways where X66 is starting to become real. Um, our, our latest demonstrator in sort of a family of demonstrators, um, the two airplanes are in California. We're cutting metal. We're putting the transonic truss brace wing on and, and, um, you know, this, this will, will we get to see a demo flight in Montreal? Not, not, not <laughs> quite, but, uh, count on us, uh, being able to talk a little bit more about what we're finding. Cause if you think about that product, that's about a 30% improvement that we're looking for as, as a, as a real flying demonstrator, not some par PowerPoint vision. So that's the kind of stuff that excites us. Yeah. So stay tuned for the, for the forum and an invitation to come join us. Thank you. I would love to do that. Um, now in the spirit of openness, please, the final round of this interview is called the rapid fire round in which we get to know Brian more a bit more personally do you speak Flemish I speak German and French <laughs> given that you grew up in yeah rural I, parts of Belgium that yeah. I've seen photos of yeah you're the, flying over yeah so I, was, I was wondering whether you did that <laughs> <laughs> what's your favorite airline Brian wow um you know, given given the business we're in, um, I, I fly on on a lot of different airlines right now. Uh, I'm on the road a lot, but I'll pick one that you that uh, I, I, nobody can uh, send me hate mail over, and that's Air Berlin. Uh -huh. Doesn't exist anymore, no. so I, I feel safe. Air Berlin uh, was your favorite airline. Well, look, I lived in Berlin, and it was sort of my <laughs> not quite daily commute, but I, I spent a lot of time on Air Berlin, and uh, they had Hamburg? a all over. Um, they had a large fleet of 737s, and you know, on the way out, they always gave you a piece of chocolate. So, uh, Air Berlin was a was a, a, a cool little airline uh, that unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. Oh. But uh, have that's... you had you ever had the privilege of going to Air Berlin's office? I have not. Have you? You're not missing much in life. <laughs> the okay. airline was much better. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we worked with them. They were former clients yeah, yeah. simply flying. So yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't the most fun. I, we always met outside in Berlin afterwards. There you go. Uh, look, not, I, there, not inside their building. <laughs> there's so many great airlines yeah. that I get to fly, but I'm, I'm not going nice. to pick a that's, favorite. That's a first on the show. What's your favorite airport? You know, Schiphol, uh, despite mm. its up and ups and downs, uh, is my, over the pandemic, which yeah. was n not surprising, frankly. Um, is a fantastic airport. It's my home airport. And sometimes literally it's from door to door, 25 minutes. Yeah. And and uh, one of the best connected airlines uh, in KLM uh, right there, you can fly anywhere direct. And so um, Schiphol is way up there. Definitely. Um, yes, one of the better airports I've been to myself. Uh, favorite book, Brian? Oof, there's a range. I, I love Malcolm Gladwell. Um, so Tipping Point uh, was, was... Outliers. Uh, outliers. I mean, uh, Blink, uh, about rapid cognition. Um, so th those those are just found fascinating and they make you reflect about people and, and situations. Um, some of the classics, good to great, um, never get old. And, and, and right. that one, you asked earlier about trust. I reread it not long ago. 
around what, what um, Jim Collins called level five leadership and, and this, uh, the, the humility be making the difference. And, you know, I've had some of my best leaders and mentors had this sort of it's a sense of hum humility um, that is infectious and that's something to aspire to. And so those are a couple, couple of good ones. Well, good one. If you enjoy Malcolm Gladwell, I think you might like Adam Grant yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and I had the privilege of being on his podcast, wow. talking a bit about aviation, and that was a lot of fun uh, around work-life balance as well. Uh, favorite city? Berlin is up there again. I got to live there for a couple of years, wow. and it's it's vibrant. Uh, not as well connected as you'd, you'd like, but uh, but it makes up for it in terms of uh, art and culture and. And I believe they finally have a new airport. Uh, they do. Yeah, <laughs> they do. it's open and and, and functional. So. Exactly. Very unlike the typical German engineering projects we know. Favorite movie? You know, you you asked me this uh, before, and I have a six year old and a nine year old at home, and so it's it's ranging from Bluey to uh, Smurfs Lost Village these days. I uh, we don't get to watch a whole whole lot of um, you know adult uh, or, or not adult movies. <laughs> adult movie. yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Uh, <laughs> movies for uh, movies show. for grown ups. <laughs> but um, you know the the one the one I really enjoyed watching and and I've watched over and over is called The Game with Michael Douglas. Uh, if you haven't watched no, it, uh, look it up. It, it, so uh, here's the here's the well complete incomplete openness. Our kids are exactly the same age. Yeah, I've got two daughters. Yeah, and the last new movie I watched was Free Willy. There you go. And they loved it. There you and go. They're like, Dad, where is this? Is yeah. this Seattle? Can we go back? Yeah. And so yes, they dominate your uh, your Absol playlist. Uh, Absolutely, we are in the same boat. There you go. <laughs> Literally. Literally. <laughs> uh, what is something you'd like to learn? Wow, um, flying. Yeah, it's been on the bucket list and uh, I came dangerously close to it once when I lived in Seattle uh, mm -hmm. and then um, had to pack up and uh, I got to move to another city for the company. But uh, one of these days when I'm uh, near a place where that's uh, a bit more accessible and uh, where I can fit it in, wow. that's something I... You know what, here's a tip for the next Boeing CEO. As part of employee perks, yeah. after five years or yeah. 10 years at Boeing, every employee gets a paid private pilot license. You know, um, the, the next CEO doesn't even need that advice because we currently have it. We have a learning together program uh -huh. that's probably one of the most generous in the world uh, and, and, and the country around tuition reimbursement. And including that, pilots Including license. pilots Oh, license. you should do it. 24 it, it, years, Brian. Exactly right. Exactly right. <laughs> um, do it on an e-plane, though. And get a pipstrel or a diamond or something, you know, you, that'd be fun. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, what do you do in your free time? Um, I like to get some exercise in when I can. Um, I do have a couple of hobbies. Um, one might call me a sneakerhead. I've been into sneakers ever since I can remember and wow. do uh, collect some and trade some. Have you read The Shoe Dog? Yes. And have you watched yeah. the movie? Yes. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. So I've, I've, I've enjoyed sneakers. Um, I do have a, a vintage Vespa sitting outside my door that's not running right now in 1971 Gran Turismo that needs some uh, care. And so uh, part of what I need to learn in addition to flying is how to work <laughs> on Vespas. I, I can tinker a little, but not a lot. So um, yeah, so those, and then of course my kids. Uh, that, that's priority number one and, and uh, it gives me a lot of energy. Fantastic. Uh, final two questions. If we are meeting a year from now, it's not in the list that you received. If you're meeting one year from now and we're popping champagne, what are we celebrating? Hmm. Maybe we're gonna have, we're gonna have tripled uh, SAF supply around the around Lovely. the globe uh, at, at, at a minimum. Okay. Um, we're gonna definitely celebrate a new release of Cascade uh, that is gonna be um, rather impressive and and and, and game changing once again. Um, and then we'll see. Look, I, we talked earlier about, and this is not one to celebrate as such, but uh, we're on a journey uh, as a company. And, and I, I think every day about, as I said earlier, the 170,000 of us that put a badge on every day. And as much as we're in the headlines for, for all the right reasons and, 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 and deserve, deservedly so in many ways, um, we're on a, on a journey to, to demonstrate and you know, re-earn trust and demonstrate who this great company is. So this is not a champagne moment, but I hope that uh, when I see you a year from now, we can look back and, and be very proud of the changes Boeing has made and the, the, the trust that we have re-earned. Amen to that, because as part of the aviation industry, we all need a very strong and thriving Boeing. 
And I do wish you all the best. And thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. You're a good man. Thank you for having me on the, on the show. And uh, keep, keep doing the great work with your podcast. Fantastic. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sustainability in the Air. Aviation is one of the hardest to decarbonize industries, yet there are multiple paths to get to net zero. Awareness is key to a green future. So please give us your support to help our sustainable aviation insights reach a wider audience. You can do this by sharing this episode on your network on LinkedIn, Twitter, or even WhatsApp. Or perhaps you might consider leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to this episode. You can start a conversation with us by writing to us at podcast at simplifying, that's simply with an I, dot com. And for more content on sustainable aviation, please visit our website green.simplifying.com and join the movement. Sustainability in the Air is an original podcast by Simplifying. The show is produced by Uri Toth in Slovakia. Dirk Singer is our Director of Sustainability, who leads research for each interviewee out of Greenwich, UK. Shubhadeep Pau is our Supervising Editor based out of Mumbai and Singapore. The articles are written by Ayushi Badola in Dehradun in India and Mira Hull in Montreal, Quebec. Creative Design is led by Lihia Esteve in Montreal. Baiba Dreamen is the project director for the show based out of Valencia, Spain. Special thanks to Wendy Sim in Singapore. And I'm Shashank Nigam, the CEO of Simplifying and your host. Please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn.